the topic of pregnancy shaming hosted by the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. My name is Reverend Katie Zay and I serve as CEO of RCRC and we're so grateful that you're here for this very important and very overdue conversation that we're gonna be having today. Just a couple of housekeeping things. These are probably things that you're already familiar with having been on Zoom before. This webinar is being recorded and we will share it with you. If questions come up during today's webinar, you can put those in the chat box and we will also set aside some time at the end for answering some of the questions. If we have a lot of questions, you'll wanna make sure to go ahead and upvote for your favorite questions. We'll take those first, so please do that as well. This webinar is the first in our winter series of conversations where we will be tackling and engaging a number of issues across the fields of reproductive freedom and decision-making, faith, and politics. This series is in part a lead up to RCRC's soon to be launched Religion and Repro Learning Center, a virtual space for reproductive freedom advocates to learn and gain an understanding of the historical and theological backdrop for today's reproductive landscape. We are partnering with leading experts in the fields of religion, history, law, ethics, medicine, and social movements to help frame the learning experiences and calls to social action. You can learn more about the Learning Center and sign up for updates at rcrc.org learning center. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, January 5th, featuring legal scholar Mary Ziegler on the topic abortion wars post Roe. For today's conversation, we will be exploring the issue of shame as it relates to different experiences of pregnancy and reproductive decision-making. For those of us from Christian traditions, we are honoring the season of Advent and the lead up to Christmas. And this is a time of year when we reflect on the significance and the sacredness of an unexpected pregnancy of an unmarried young woman many years ago. As religious and spiritual advocates for reproductive freedom, no matter what traditions we come from, this season offers us a unique opportunity for all of us to think about what it means to have a reproductive experience or be on a reproductive journey that does not fit within the confines of the narrowly prescribed and often ill-fitting rules of our society and faith traditions. We know that shame, stigma, and silence impact many of us as we navigate our reproductive lives, as we encounter infertility or an unexpected pregnancy or a pregnancy loss, as we make decisions about whether to continue a pregnancy, to parent or create our families in different ways, or determine that parenting will not be part of our journey at all. These are the real stories of our lives, and yet so often they remain hidden because of the judgment and the lack of compassion we have as a society and as religious communities. Today, we are going to be bringing some of those experiences and stories into the light, thanks to these amazing panelists that I have the honor of being in conversation with today. And I'm going to introduce them all briefly. First, we have Reverend Brandy Jasmine mimitz Ryan. Who was, or, who was an ordained itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was ordained in 2003. She holds master's degrees in divinity and theological studies from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and, and a master's degree in philosophy. She is currently working towards completing a PhD program in theology and philosophy at Drew University, Casperson School of Graduate Studies. And you'll hear that all of our panelists actually have a connection to Drew, which was fun to learn. She has served as assistant and associate pastor in AME congregations in Chicago, Denver, and Orange, New Jersey. She is currently appointed to serve as pastor to the members of the Mighty Quinn Chapel AME Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she is also part of the leadership team of the new Nebraska RCRC affiliate. Reverend Brandy, we're so glad to have you. Next, we have Reverend Shannon Sullivan, a lifelong feminist and United Methodist currently serving the community of Frederick, Maryland as the Associate Pastor of Calvary. She is a proud graduate of Drew Theological School in Madison, New Jersey. She's married to Erin Harrington, her high school sweetheart, aw, who is a pilot and all-around aviation geek. They have one living child who they are raising in a house cluttered by books and airplane parts. 
Shannon is one of the contributing editors of two books of prayers and devotions written by and for young women in leadership, including Speaking Truth, Women Raising Their Voices in Prayer, in which Reverend Mimitz Ryan is also a contributor. More of Shannon's writings can be found at shannonesullivan.com. And last, we have Reverend Dr. Carrie Jackson, RCRC's Director of Spiritual Care and Activism. She collaborates with religious and community leaders advocating for reproductive freedom as a vital aspect of human dignity and divine integrity. Carrie seeks to help foster a society in which religious pluralism and cultural diversity are valued as she believes a society's greatness is reflected in its demonstrated commitment to honor, care for and nurture of each individual, especially those marginalized, most marginalized. She coaches leaders to strengthen their capacity and courage as agents of social healing and transformation. She is a minister in the United Church of Christ who grew up in the Pentecostal church and participates regularly in other spiritual traditions. Dr. Carrie has a PhD in Christian social ethics, also from Drew University, and is the author of several books. Wow, these are incredible women. I'm so glad to have all of you here. This is going to be such a good conversation. And we're honored to have three Christian clergywomen in particular in this conversation because we know that so much, not all, but so much of the shaming and the stigma around our reproductive lives come from Christian leaders and communities. So with that, we'll start with our first question. And Shannon, I'm gonna start with you. Could you please share with us your own experience with shame on your reproductive journey and what impact it had on you? So you heard in my bio that I'm married to my high school sweetheart and um, we started trying to have children five years ago and went through um, a, a, a long journey of infertility and pregnancy loss. So I think I first encountered shame in the journey when for over a year there was no positive um, pregnancy test. And being a very driven person, always been successful and really at that point in my life, nothing bad had ever really happened to me. And so I had all this shame around like, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my body? What did I do wrong? And that kind of stuck with me throughout uh, the journey, um, not just with infertility, but then when I had my first miscarriage. Um, and I had heard stories of infertility. I knew people who had miscarriages. I had even sat at the bedside of those who grieved pregnancy loss and child loss. Um, and yet when it happened to me, I still had that sense of, well, what's wrong with me? Even though as a pastor, I knew that I would never ever say that to someone else or even think that about someone else. But that's still the, the way that shame had just rooted itself in my body. Um, when I had my first miscarriage, I was very lucky that my doctor immediately shut down any ideas that, that I had done something to cause this. Um, I know that a lot of women do not uh, necessarily have a doctor who, who says that to them right away, but yet it still persisted. So I think that that, that is probably a very common experience uh, for folks who, who struggle with infertility and pregnancy loss. But um, one of the other issues with shame in my experience um, also came around being a pastor um, and the culture of call that we often have as pastors. Um, we, uh, in the United Methodist tradition, um, we had to jump, <laughs> jump through hoops is probably not the right word to use, but uh, we had a lot of um, interviews, uh, essays to write, those sorts of things. And one of the things that they really have you do over and over and over again is talk about your call to ministry. And I recognized in my own journey to become a mother that um, a mother of living children, that I also had a call to motherhood. And so, and you'll hear that a lot, I think, especially in Christian um, circles, this, this call to being a mother. I felt called to being a mother. And why I had so much shame around that is because we had so many 
roadblocks, so many difficulties, so much struggle that um, that and the the things that you'll hear hear people say about how God doesn't um, call the equipped but equips the called, you know. And one of my issues with recurring pregnancy loss was that I have a chromosomal chromosomal abnormality um, that makes me incapable of having children in a lot of ways. And so um, there was this misunderstanding. Um, if, if my body could not do this, was I misunderstanding God's call um, to pastoring, not just to motherhood, but God's call throughout my life. Um, and then I was ashamed that I kept trying if I wasn't, if I was misunderstanding God's call, then why was I doing what I wanted and not what God wanted? And so the shame was both in the, ex the experience of my body, but also in the experience of call in this um, culture of call. Shannon, what you shared is so rich and complex about the kind of confusion around I feel a calling and yet my body is not a co-creator with this calling. What does that mean? And all of the, the faith questions, even for those of us who have studied all of the great theological works, right? We still in those moments don't have an understanding. Thank you so much for sharing, for sharing that experience. We're looking forward to talking with you more as we move through this conversation. Um, Brandy, would you like to share about your experience of, of shame on your reproductive journey and the impact it had on you. Thank you. Um, I am the mother of two sons, their donor conceived. Um, and my journey really started when I was at Drew um, for my PhD program. And I was diagnosed with infertility. I was 25 years old and the doctor said, you will never have kids. And I, okay, I'll never have kids. Like that was my my given, I was just going to not have kids. And so I decided that this was going to be a thing and I would just be married to the academy. And then I rolled down the stairs and had to really rethink what I was doing with my life. And I decided I wanted kids and it had to happen immediately because I'm infertile and Dr. Carol Gagliardi could get me pregnant. And, and most of my shame at that point was external. Um, I'm one of those, I will do whatever I want type people. Um, but the, the shame that I had came from professors who would read each other's works, right? And then decide that, well, this book says that the power of one is a problem. So why would you want to be a single mom? Um, and then from the church, um, some, some bishops, I wanna say clearly, some bishops were actually supportive, but then other bishops and other clergy people were, were you're gonna ruin your life if you have kids. You're gonna ruin your body if you have kids. How do you think you can do this by yourself? And then there was the, the additional um, shame of the misunderstanding of black single motherhood, right? Like black single moms are everything that's wrong with society. And here you want to participate in that. So not only are you doing something that we don't want you to do, but it's gonna harm the whole of society if you do it. Um, and that came from, from, from colleagues and the church, from people in the academy, and even from my own family members, right? Um, and so the shame that I had was, was piled on the gender and the race and the class. This is not what we do. We don't choose to be single moms. Um, and I remember one of my family members, I don't talk to this person no more, um, was adamant that it was better for me to never have kids ever than to do this by myself. Um, and that the reason we don't talk anymore is if I chose to be a single mom by choice, if I chose to purposefully go out and have kids, um, th that, that they would not be able to participate in my life. They would not be able to, to um, accept those children. If I adopted, they could accept them, but not if I went out and got pregnant. Um, so that was, we're still working through that shame. My, my oldest is 12. Um, and then there's always continually, even now, and again, my oldest is 12, the you have some man hiding somewhere. We know you do. You might as well go and admit it and go and get married because we're clear that this was not your choice. Um, 
that this is something that somebody did to you and you're not free to choose to have children in a, in a way that we don't understand and don't accept. And I fight with people and no, I really did use a sperm bank. I really did pay for this, right? Like I, me and the sperm bank of California are on really good terms. And they're convinced that I was left by a man that this is not my own initiative, but, but um, that I'm a victim of something else. Um, so the, the, I, for me, the shaming is a lot of external dumping um, rooted in some real misconceptions of what it means to be a single mom and then how we do that as clergy people. And then how do we appoint pastors? I was already ordained, but along the way I had to go to seek appointment. How do I appoint you as a pastor and you're a single mom? Um, what will the people say? And the people said some really ugly things, but what do we do with you? And how do we put you somewhere? Because we have to make sure that you have a way to feed these kids. And if you don't, then it'll look bad on us, right? Um, not that we care about whether you do or not. We just wanna make sure we look good. So it's, for me, it's always been a lot of really dealing with other people's stuff with the shame and how we see there's one path to motherhood and everybody that deviates from that, there's something wrong with us. Um, and, and really trying to exert my own choice to, to be a mom and my choice to do it in this way. Um, and then, and not, one of my brothers said, you could just go and find a man on the street and do this. You don't have to pay for it. I value my body. And to be able to say, I value my body enough to, to care about what I put in it um, and how I use it on my path to being a mom. Randy, thank you so much and your your story and your path just bump up against all of these oppressive norms of whiteness and being partnered and um, it bumps up against class issues and, and, and all of these different realities. And um, I can tell that you are a very resilient and, of, and resolved person and yet to think about all the missed opportunity for support in your life of folks just not understanding and choosing to stay in a place of fear rather than coming to you in a place of love and support is really heartbreaking and really at the at the heart of the matter about why we wanted to talk about this so hopefully others do not experience that external shaming that you did so thank you for being willing to to share that with us and that it's still a process of healing that you're going through um, all these years later. So Carrie, please share with us what what has your experience with shame around your reproductive life and decisions looked like? What impact has that had on you? You're muted, Carrie. I'm 64 years old. I had a hysterectomy about 15 years ago. My reproductive years have long passed. So my story relating to pregnancy shaming was really in my 20s and 30s as a gay woman who wanted to become pregnant. I am a mother. That is who I am as a human being. And I really wanted to parent. And as a gay woman, the options that were available for me 30, 40 years ago were very limited. And so I was really thinking through um, pregnancy, what that would look like and be like for me. Um, one, because I really, I am a mother, I wanted to parent children. I parent a lot of adults, but I, I wanted to parent children. And, um, and I wanted that experience of pregnancy in, in my own body. And so I began exploring different options. And what ended up happening for me, I started experiencing a lot of pain in my body. And it felt very located in my in my butt. The pain was so excruciating till 
I bought a donut to sit on when I was in the car. I would arrive various places. I couldn't go in, um, whether it was work or school, church, whatever, because I was in so much pain. And I didn't know what the pain was really derived from went to doctor after doctor after doctor thinking I had uh, some medical condition only to be told, no, everything looks fine in your body. We don't know why you're experiencing this pain. And finally, I was sent to someone who was a oncologist, a, a gastroenterologist um, oncologist and because my doctor said, maybe that's where you need to go. Maybe there's cancer in your body that's causing you the pain. When I met with this doctor, he said to me, most doctors do not know what you have, but I do because I had it also. You have levator Amy syndrome. What? What is that? What the heck is that? Basically, you have a tight ass. He didn't say I am a tight ass, but you know, I had a tight ass that was really brought on by anxiety, fear, and stress. And so then I went to a therapist to unpack. So what am I anxious about? That it would have this kind of presence in my body. And in therapy, I uncovered that the fear of being shamed about being a lesbian, single mother, pregnant, or even if I, you know, I was partnered at the time, but again, back then, if you're partnered, you're still single because, you know, you're going through some phase, you're going to get over it, and we don't count and don't validate your relationship. And so the shaming around being a gay woman. Um, and my family, where I was emotionally at the time in my twenties and thirties, what my family thought about me loomed so large in my life that I could not pass that barrier because all of the anger and the shame I, that I knew would come from my family from my church community and, and the broader society, I knew I couldn't do it. And as a black woman in America, I'd already experienced so much shaming of my body that I knew I didn't have the emotional fortitude to deal with the kind of public shaming that I knew was coming. And so the sad news in all of that for me is I have never had the experience of pregnancy. So I have a pregnancy related shaming, but not ever having been pregnant. Carrie, you too, thank you for sharing um, about so much vulnerability in your life and how our bodies can hold so much painful truth that sometimes it's kind of our last line of, of a wake up. There's something yeah, to pay yeah. attention to. Um, but also again, thinking about, you know, not being able to create our families and what, what infertility in a broader sense means is it's not just a physical condition or not having a partner, but just not having the social support mm -hmm. to have children and to feel safe about raising children is its own form of infertility for lack of a better word. I mean, it's mm -hmm. impeding, it, it impeded your ability to create the family that you desired. And mm -hmm. um, I'm thankful for you sharing. I've, I, we've talked about this before, but each time I think it just, it breaks my heart open for you. And I'm thankful to be someone who is spiritually mothered by you. So for that, I am grateful. I want to remind everybody, quick correction. If you have a question, there's actually a Q&A box. Thank you, Mel, our tech person, and more uh, for alerting me. So if you have some questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We will dedicate about 10 minutes to the end 
of our time together to your questions. Okay, so question two, what did you learn about yourself from this experience? What did it teach you about yourself, but also your community and society as a whole to have gone through this? And um, Shannon, if it's okay, I'm gonna come back to you. Well, so Brandy talked about that external shaming. And I think what I learned is how much external shaming we have from well-meaning comments. Um, I was very open about my journey, um, especially uh, after our first miscarriage because I was a solo pastor at the time and, um, and because I didn't know how to function otherwise um, because I was just grieving so much. Um, and so many people would say things like, you know, relax, if you get rid of the stress in your life, um, if you stop using this kind of soap, if you stop drinking the water, you know, those, all those kinds of things. Like, if you do something, you can cure what is happening to your body. Um, and as I said before, not only is that wrong for the majority of us, but I also had a, ended up having a chromosomal abnormality. And so that's why I was having miscarriages, um, which you can't drink water, different kinds of water to, <laughs> to cure. Um, so, so I think like what I learned is um, how even those people who are well-meaning um, can just kind of dig the knife in a little bit more. Um, and in addition to that, how many people just want to fix things um, for you? And, um, and often that adds a lot more shame, especially in the context of a church and especially in the context of, you know, being in leadership in the church, um, because then people are asking you questions about your sex life, basically, without even realizing that that's what they're asking. Um, and so, so there's added levels of shame uh, in there. Um, the other thing that I learned uh, was that the brand of feminism that I grew up with um, and the way that I kind of understand uh, what being a feminist was to my life uh, what had a lot of weakness to it as well, because so much of it was about, you can do anything, you can do everything, you can do it all. Um, and I think that also comes from my particular experience of, of being white and middle-class. Um, and so there's really no room for failure in that, unless you can blame it on um, misogyny or, or sexism or something like that. Um, but in my case, this was something that I felt so called to that I so deeply wanted and could not make possible for five years. And so, so feeling like a failure in terms of a feminist as well. Um, and that also um, was true in the Christian community. There's not room for failure in feminism, but there's not room for failure in Christianity either. Um, so many people I trusted, so many people who um, even in other situations had, had looked up to me as a leader would say things about like, well, you know, maybe you're not really called to be a mother if it hasn't happened yet for you. Um, and so the way that our internalized shame, but also in our communities, how people just don't think about the things that they say. And even I don't think about the things that I had said as, as a pastoral caregiver um, and how difficult it was to then continue to be in, in these communities where I felt like such a lack of support. Um, though the people who were offering me the things they were offering would think that that was support. And so I think that was something that I, I struggled with a lot. Mm. We just finished up this amazing series that Carrie and Melanie on our team created, our Compassion School. And I've learned so much about what compassion is and it's a much more complex process than we think. And it does require our ability to separate someone else's experience from our own 
and dealing with the discomfort of the unpleasant feelings that come up. And I think sometimes when someone is experiencing a loss or, or is going through grief, it triggers our own grief. And then we center ourselves in the response because we want to alleviate our own suffering rather than what the person in front of us needs. And I think with regard to this of, of reproductive loss of some kind of a miscarriage or infertility, folks are often just so triggered by the negative feelings of just being in the presence of someone who's suffering that we forget that part of compassion, which is to step back and center the person who's hurting. I'm so sorry that that happened and sadly not surprised, <laughs> not surprised that that happened to you. And I hope that maybe you can help us um, think of some other things to offer folks who are going through something like that. Hmm. Carrie, how about you? Uh, what have you learned about yourself and our faith communities through this experience you went through? Well, one thing I learned about me was that I was much more dependent upon the acceptance and affirmation of my family and church community at that time. Again, I've, I've moved uh, light years from that now. And in large part, my experience as a 20, 30 something year old lesbian is what helped push me beyond the, the need for acceptance and, and affirmation from some people. Because I said, that's controlling my life. I need to be honest and true and authentic to who I am because that's where my joy and my happiness are. So it, it was one of those things for me that because I, people who knew that I was gay or who suspected that I was gay in my Pentecostal church context, um, they were saying to me, um, when are you gonna get married and have children? Even though they suspected that I was gay, but because we didn't talk about um, sexuality in an open way, it was discriminated against tremendously, but no real honest conversation about it. So there was this constant push for me to do the thing that was acceptable, um, be married and have a child. Um, not just have a child, but be married and child. And people would often talk with me about how loving and nurturing I was and how um, what a great mother I would be. Of course, not knowing, and, and maybe if they did know, not really valuing and honoring the kind of wrestling that, that I was going through. Um, as I saw so many people who I love becoming pregnant, and some of them are not mothers I would want for myself, but they, they could become pregnant and, um, and that was not part of my own reality. So it was a, a real, um, I'd say lonely experience for me. And often when there's conversation about, um, about pregnancy and pregnancy shaming, stories like mine are not included. And that's why I, I put myself on this panel because I really wanted um, to be able to, to bring that experience in as well. And then there are the people, now I'm gonna go broader to, to other people. And that is the experience of folks who have many years between pregnancy. And you know, Shannon, you were talking about people getting into your sex life people who have these long spans between the, the ages of their children get people entering into their sex life. So what's, what's that about? And, and I had people trying to enter my sex life as well. And I would never ask, inquire, try to figure out what somebody is doing in their own, in the intimacy of, of their own um, sex lives. And Yet there's this incredible freedom that people have, that many people seem to have when it comes to women's bodies and if they're pregnant, how they got pregnant, if they don't get pregnant, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, and I especially find that true in, in church community. 
Yeah, it's almost like public property. Um, there's a lot of parallels to the way that abortion is talked about as if that's a public yeah. conversation about real people and the situations that they're in. And I had to just laugh because in the chat box, Carolyn Meager was talking about this. I don't know if you saw it, Carrie. She wrote, I had a third child much later in my life, many years after my first two children. So many people asked if it was planned, basically asking about my sex life. They tried to shame or embarrass me. I eventually told people when they asked if it was planned, it was the best sex ever. <laughs> We have to find those coping strategies to deal with the questions. And I'll just share really briefly. I, my husband and I have one child. We're happy about that. And we are constantly asked when we will have another. Um, and so again, it's just we those questions from the asker can seem very innocuous. And yet there can be so much pain connected to those kinds of questions, not to mention that they're inappropriate but that they can be so hurtful in ways that we never even know. So it's, it's a good reminder not to ask people about their bodies or their reproduction unless they want to talk about that with us. Mm -hmm. Randy, let me, let me turn to you. Are there things that you learned about yourself? I mean, you shared some of them already, but anything you didn't mention um, in the first part of this conversation about things you learned or things you learned about your, your faith community or society as a whole? Um, yes, I, about my community and about society, what I learned um, is that everybody that says they are feminists are really a feminist. Um, because, and it wasn't just women, it, especially the male feminists um, had this notion that what I did with my body and how I chose to procreate um, was flying in the face of what they thought that feminism should be. Um, especially with my first and then more so for some reason, differently with my second and, and the, the miscarriage I had between them. But this was not what feminists do. Like all these feminists have fought for your right to, to just choose to not be a mom. And here you are being just this whole wanton thing, right? And it wasn't just that she wear pumps and, and corsets, but here you are out here fighting to be a mom. And it wasn't easy. And I gloss over the, the, the challenges that I had to go through as someone who is infertile, trying to get pregnant by myself, right? Um, and, and you're doing all of these things and having hot flashes and, and taking all of these meds to be a mom. And that's not what feminists do. And it was especially the men. Um, and so that's what I, the, the first thing I learned about my community. With the second child, my, my youngest, my eight-year-old, what I learned is that there is a deep mistrust of science um, in the church. Um, and not just, okay, well, science and God aren't compatible, but my son was four before people stopped calling him a clone. And it was, you do those weird things with science to have kids. Um, and so we know you cloned them. They look just alike. And so we're clear that he's a clone. And, and then of course you can have a third, right? Cause it's not your body. This is the science thing that you did. And and granted, you can't carry another third, another child, but you could have a third because science. Um, and and nobody cared what it did to me, what it did to my body, and and what I thought about having another child or carrying another child, or whether it was possible for me to even try to get pregnant again. It was science, and and I could just go and clone another baby. Um, and and so that's what I learned about my community. What I learned about myself was exactly what Shannon shared at the beginning was how much of my, this is what I'm gonna do, was just covering up some internal shame, right? Like when I was in seminary at Garrett, I had an eating disorder. And so by the time I was trying and fighting to have my second child and, and, and up dosing on Clomid for the fifth and sixth time, um, it was, this is all my fault. If I hadn't been anorexic in seminary, then my endocrine system wouldn't be messed up and I would be able to have kids. Um, and, and I never had a doctor tell me different. So that, that for me was, okay, I'm gonna do this. I have to do this because I have to redeem myself. Um, and, and the necessity for me to rethink my theology, I think is, is what I really learned. Um, that there was something about me desiring to be a mom that wasn't necessarily called to motherhood, but that I could see myself as whole and different through this process. 
Um, and then, then even now through these, this last 12 year journey and one of them had cancer, it's just been a whole thing. I got to learn what it meant to be human. And I think that's what I learned um, throughout even the shame is that I will fight against the, the, the foolishness that other people say. And the foolish things that I think about me um, just because I get to be human and see what that means throughout this process. All of you have talked about tremendous growth, but at what cost and through so much pain and, and loss. And I know that that's when growth happens for most of us, but hearing what each of you had to go through in those internal questions of, am I worthy? Did I do something to deserve this? Um, and that the loneliness and the isolation that comes from those kinds of questions, it just, it breaks my heart, even knowing that each of you have found healing. It's just, I think we can all in one way or another kind of put ourselves in that situation, which is why we want to have these conversations, right? To talk about the complexities and what really, really happens for folks. And we know that shame around reproductive decisions it takes all different kinds of forms. It's very common. Each of your experiences is unique. And yet there are, there are things that people are going through right now where they're asking these same kinds of questions, maybe in different circumstances, but similar questions as they're navigating either difficult circumstances or difficult decisions. So I'm gonna kind of combine some questions. So forgive me for stacking these, but what would you say to someone who's experiencing shame around their reproductive lives right now? And what would you say to the folks who are in community with them? What can you offer as comfort and what can you offer as a recommendation to disrupt the shame and replace it with compassion? Can I go first? I know I said I wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. See, we said spirit would move you to go first at some point. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I want to reconnect this back to the Advent story that we're in. And what I tell people who are like me, thinking about being a single mom by choice, are feeling, struggling with how to do that within their own Black church context and trying to figure out what it means, especially as a Black woman, to be a single mom by choice is it's not just Hagar. There's not a story of pregnancy in the Bible that happens in a way that is normal, right? Like, and if we look at who Mary was and what the Bible says about how she got pregnant, she was a single mom by choice too. That was a, as much reproductive technology as they had. I just did it the new, the new school way um, that Mary did. And if we can look at Mary and find value in, in how she conceived, if we can look at Mary, at Mary's child and find value in who he was as this child whose mother should have been thrown away, um, then we can, we can choose to participate in life in this way. We can choose to conceive by ourselves, to knock ourselves up because Mary did too. And, and it's not just her, there's, there's stories throughout the Bible of conceptions that happened in weird ways, right? Whether it was the Abraham and Hagar, whether it was um, even Elizabeth, things aren't normal in pregnancies in the Bible. And if we're looking for, okay, this happens between one man and one woman, and it's easy the very first time they try, they get pregnant, and then they have all these kids. I mean, even, you know, Jacob and Esau fighting in the womb, things aren't normal in the Bible. And so we get to, to be human in the same way that the biblical stories are. We get to value ourselves and our struggles in the same way that we value what we preach and what we teach and, and what we read about and what we hold on to as our faith stories. Um, and so that's the comfort that I take, especially in this Advent season where she's expecting and, and I got pregnant for the first time in Advent. So she hears that you will be pregnant and it's not your choice. And I'm going to get you pregnant and nobody else will know what happened. Um, and, and that's what I heard. And it's like, okay, well, here I am pregnant like Mary and you can do it too. And it'll be okay. And just like God saw Mary and valued her and we call her blessed among the women, God will value you too and call you blessed among women for your struggle, for your choice, for even the pain that comes with it and how hard it is to get there. Um, so I, that's, that's how I find comfort is Ain't no such thing as a normal woman. So we're just gonna stop pretending. 
I knew we would get some good preaching in here. That was great. I love how you said there's no normal in our sacred story. So why would we think it's any different? And there are, yeah, so many stories of folks navigating really difficult decisions, also sometimes really perpetuating harm against each other while they figure that out. But I appreciate you lifting that up and making a connection to the Advent story. And for us to have that theological imagination about what is possible right now, just as it was then. Shannon, how about you? You think of things that would would have been helpful um, or ways to disrupt these cycles of shame that are in our society and in our faith communities. I think a lot of what's been said already about um, what Brandy said about it being necessary for us to rethink our theology, um, but also to take a minute, you were talking about different faith stories. I think pretty much the story of every single woman in scripture is a story of resilience. It's not a story of um, of waiting around for God uh, to do what we think God should do. It's about you know, making a way out of no way. Um, and uh, I think too often, especially when we look at the Mary story and, and see her, I had to rewrite some um, children's pageant stuff uh, <laughs> this past week and focus on her being courageous. Like that's what she was um, instead of just a passive uh, bystander to what happened to her. So I think that, um, uh, first of all, comfort, um, you know, just keep putting one foot in front of um, the other um, as much as you can. I think that the other piece that I would say um, would be, um, would be really about don't be afraid of asking uh, or or saying what you need. Um, I think, you know, we, we brought up, uh, was it Carolyn's statement um, earlier about her responses when people kept asking if her child was planned. Um, I think that especially in churches where we're taught to be nice and taught to like focus on, well, they mean well. Well, sometimes you get, just get so tired of hearing the same things early uh, over and over again that especially if people really do love you it is okay to say even if you do it in a funny way like it was the best sex ever is what carolyn said how she started to respond um, to people but to tell people what you need and to say like i appreciate you um you know uh, telling me not to drink the water from our community because whatever, whatever. Um, but what I really need right now is for you just to hold my hand and, you know, maybe pray for me instead of telling me how I can fix this. Um, I, I think that sometimes we need that permission um, to interrupt uh, folks in that way. Um, but in terms of the, the, kind of disrupting um, in, in rethinking our theology. I think that especially for me as a faith leader, one of the things that I try and do is this rethinking our theology as Brandy was talking about. Um, and one of the big ways I do that is, is trying to focus on how meaning making is, is an action that we do. We can do it with God, but when we are trying to make meaning out of our stories, I talked a lot about um, my call to motherhood and that struggle that I had, that shame that I had, where am I not even understanding God if God isn't giving me a baby, right? But meaning making is an action that we do. We take what happens to us and, and take the next step and try to figure out what else instead of sitting there and waiting for God to do whatever. I think often in the church, uh, I had mentioned those folks who said to me, well, maybe you just misunderstood God. And then feeling the shame of keeping, of continuing to do fertility treatments, um, if that's against what God's will is. When instead, if we think of, of 
a theology, think of these stories of resilient women um, in scripture who just keep moving forward and God is with them and God is with us as well. And so I think that's one of the things that we really have to do to disrupt is to, to relook at our theology instead of God doing things to us to take what happens to us and to make meaning out of it and to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Can I piggyback yes. on that just real quick? Is that allowed, Carrie? Can I do that? I don't want to. Of course it's allowed. Um, so no, I, I think this, when we're talking about rethinking our theology, um, you got the, am I rethinking, am I hearing God right, right? And I got the, you're playing God. Like God has said, you can't have kids and now you're going to have them and you're going to do them in this way. You are playing God. And for me, part of that rethinking is what does it mean to be human, right? Humans have the ability to do this. Humans have the ability to choose to get pregnant. Some of us can't. And so what does that mean? Am I less than human because it's not working for me? Like there is no way I'm naturally going to get pregnant. Not never. I don't ovulate. It's never going to happen. So am I less than human because of that? And all of this, this science that has happened over the last... 2000 years, even the last 20, does it participating in that mean that I'm not human? Am I not supposed to go to the doctor and have the doctor say, no, 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 this is possible. What does it mean for me to be, as Bart says, a free human standing before God, if I cannot participate in life that humans create, if I cannot participate in the life of science and the life of the mind in this way? And, and I think for me, the, the conversations that I had with the conservative Christians were really like, you found a way to do what God told you to do, to be fruitful and multiply, great job. And it was the, the liberal um, <laughs> feminist Christians that were really like, you're taking this power into your own hands and you don't have the right. And for me, it's really, we're human. God gives us the authority over our bodies and we get to go to the doctor and exercise that authority. And that for me was how I had to re reconstruct my theology because I'm not a, a process theologian. I don't have power like that. Um, but I do get to have authority over me and authority over what I do with me. And, and I think when we're having these conversations, when I'm having them with other women about what does it mean to be in this situation, you get to have authority over yourself. You get to decide for you what this looks like for you. Um, and I don't want to leave that part out. Just Katie, I know. Bart, I'm just saying that's a theologian right there quoting Bart. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, did Katie, you I know we need, I know we need to get to questions, but I, I want to say this. I'm hearing from Brandy and Shannon something that's so dear to my heart, and that is really looking at our theology. Who is it that we understand God to be? That gives people license to shame someone when all they're doing is traveling their own unique journey. And, and each of us has our own journey. And, you know, does God travel? You know, does God only go one way on the path? Or is there only one path that God travels on? Um, there's all of these people and we have these uh, varieties of paths. And is our God big enough to journey with each of us in our different paths. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, we have quite a few questions. We're apologies, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I'm going to go with the one that's ranked at the top for now. And this has to do with scripture and infertility, which I think is a nice segue from what we were just saying. Um, this is a long, there's some explanations, so I think I might try to summarize. How can we how can we reclaim scripture to make it less hateful and hurtful to infertile people and couples? So many of these stories explain infertility as something that is ordained by God. God closed her womb to make a point, to punish, to bring someone really great into the world, etc. Um, we've evolved so much in our thinking. How do we move to where we need to be if we're going to be a compassionate community? So um, at least one of the places to start is for me, 
when I preach those scriptures, when I talk about uh, the God closing the womb, I talk about how that's how I felt. That's not what God was doing, but I kind of, I, I use those stories to talk about like the very real feelings of isolation and despair and disconnect um, from our community that we have. Um, it is very difficult, and I found it very difficult before having a living child, that every single story of infertility in scripture ends with a child, um, and how those scriptures are used, like, look at Sarah, there's still hope for you, um, and feeling very much like what I needed from those stories instead was the very real experience of that acknowledging that you know, Leah felt so desperate and I mean, Rachel felt so desperate and Leah just kept popping out babies. The, I, I mean, like as someone who saw friend after friend after friend after friend get pregnant, um, doing weddings for people who weren't even married when we were trying, you know, and, and oh, now they have two kids and, um, so, so really tapping into the very real desperation um, that Rachel felt and allowing us to feel real pain. I think that so often we read stories looking for a nice um, sanitized ending or even just a nice uh, uh, the end happily ever after. Um, and scripture doesn't give us that. Sometimes the way that we use it in church um, does give us that, but scripture doesn't give us that. And even those stories of infertility that end with a baby are not, and they lived happily ever after. Um, and so I think acknowledging that um, is really important. We are, we just have a few minutes. I want to name some of the things that have come up knowing we won't be able to get to all of them. Questions like shame around adoption infertility in men and what shame looks like specifically for them. Um, talking about the intersections with um, age, race, gender role stereotype, disability. Someone asked, you know, what if Mary had had cancer while she was pregnant and looking at some of those intersections. Um, but I think I might end with this because it's a, it's a imagining what might, it might be, which I think is always helpful in these conversations what would a community of support look like for for you so if you could imagine going back what would that what would that look like we are people of faith we dare to imagine that which we have not seen for me it is a community that nurtures people recognizing that each person has their own path and not, not presuming that what you want for your life and what you value for your life is what the, someone else should want and value for, for their lives. And I think communities of faith in particular have tremendous difficulty for individuals to decenter themselves when they're journeying with someone else. And I, I, I think we need to practice decentering ourselves and, and really hear, you know, before we offer the recommendations and, you know, hear what is it, how are you feeling? And what do you want and need? And how can I be of support to you? For communities to really engage with those kinds of questions about any and everything that people are going through. For, to me, that's a, a beautiful, caring and compassionate community. And one I, I long for more in, in more spaces. Thank you, Shannon or Brandy, a quick, a quick hope or a dream. I think if we took seriously that that notion that it takes a village to raise a child um, and extend it back past just the raising of the child, but even to conceive one, 
even to think of conceiving a child and to begin the support there um, and not wait until the child is born. Um, I, I think that part would have been helpful for me um, back then. I, yeah, I started crying because I remembered what back then felt like. And in that part, to, to be loved on in the thinking process would have been helpful. I love that image. Thank you. Shannon, any last thoughts? No? Well, I hope all of you who have joined in are joining me and saying thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing, amazing panelists. This has been a rich conversation that we could have spent so much more time on. I hope it's the first of many conversations like this one. And I just want to, again, express my deep gratitude for being willing to share your stories and share your lessons learned and your theological wisdom and insight with us today. So thanks everyone. This will be shared once we have the recording. And remember our next webinar will be Tuesday, January 5th, featuring legal scholar Mary Ziegler on the topic of abortion wars post row. So wishing all of you a safe and healthy rest of this year. And we will see you in 2021. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.